The Slender Man, also known as Slenderman, is a fictional character that originated as an internet meme created by Something Awful Forums user Eric Knudsen, aka Victor Surge, in 2009. It is depicted as resembling a thin, unnaturally tall man with a blank and usually featureless face, wearing a black suit. Stories of the Slender Man commonly feature him stalking, abducting, or traumatizing people, particularly children. 1. The Slender Man is not confined to a single narrative, but appears in many disparate works of fiction, mostly composed online. 2. Origin. The Slender Man was created on a thread in the Something Awful Internet Forum begun on June 8, 2009, with the goal of editing photographs to contain supernatural entities. On June 10, a forum poster with the username Victor Surge contributed two black and white images of groups of children, to which he added a tall, thin spectral figure wearing a black suit. 3. 4. Although previous entries had consisted solely of photographs, Surge supplemented his submission with snatches of text, supposedly from witnesses, describing the abductions of the groups of children, and giving the character the name The Slender Man. Once happened a time deep in the Redwood Forest there live a poor woman and her daughter Rosie who was 12 years old. One day Rosie asked her mom if there were monsters under her bed. The mother replied with a very strange voice and said why yes my dear, did it scare you are you afraid? Rosie looked kind of worried hearing her mother say that she slowly responds yes, kinda, but I'm a good little good mama, right? Rosie's mom reply no you're not I asked you yesterday to get me some wild flowers to set the table and you disobeyed me now go and get me some flowers right now Rosie stormed out the door running as fast as she could as she was running Rosie fell. Rosie had tripped over a doll that looked looked all old with evil eyes sharp teeth. Rosie got curious about the clown she found that she picked it up and started to hug it. Rosie then started to talk to the ugly clown telling it she would love it forever and he would be her best friend, at that moment the clown doll started to laugh then stopped. Rosie just smiled and forgot about the flowers her mother had told her to pick up. Rosie just turned around looked at the clown doll and told the doll do you want to meet my mother she is kind of creepy always telling me if I'm scared and I don't listen very well she just gives me the creeps let go meet her Mr. Funny Face, Rosie started back home when she got there her mother was getting dinner ready the mother's back was facing Rosie at that time Rosie entered the house and the door slammed shut behind Rosie quickly Rosie's mother's jumps with such fear and turns around and tells Rosie for Christ's sake you scared the life out of me child wait a minute young lady where are the flower that I told you to get for me Rosie's mother got very mad at her they asked her what you got there young lady Rosie looked at her doll and then smiled at her mother with an evil smile then replies this is Mr. Funny Face and he said you have been a bad mother here lately mother it's time to play the game mother the mother yelled out what are you talking about what game Rosie Rosie replies the game are you afraid mother right at this time the clown come alive and attacked Rosie's mother and bit Rosie's mother's neck ripping her throat out Rosie the keep laughing and skipping around a circle saying over and over to her mother oh look at you, laying all dead on the for who's got your throat now mother are you afraid now you should be look at you all dead and afraid. Rosie then started to sign la 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 she then stopped and quickly turned around and looked at you then gives you a evil eye look and tells you are you afraid now. Mr. Funny Face can stop that for you laughing ha ha he. At this time Mr. Funny Face jumps right at you and kills you. The end. La 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 la. The Dullivan back in the 80s, the local mall held a few Halloween events where children attended to paint, get free candy, see a puppet show or watch a magician. During this time, I went to one and had my first introduction to the concept of the headless horseman. At 8 years old, I knew the adults were in costumes, however seeing someone walking around with no mask or no head had me bewildered in trying to figure out what I seen. To my relief, a head peeped through the chest to drink some pot revealing the man in a sum costume. When I asked the individual what he dressed up as, his response was the headless horseman from the legend of Sleepy Hollow. A few years would pass before I would read the story along with the myth of the Irish Dullivan in the final installment about Monsters of Nightmares series. Before the internet, any information you wanted to learn about required a trip to the local library. While, seeking out a book to do a report on, I came across a cover with the title Sleepy Hollow on it. 
In recalling the events during that Halloween event, I settled on checking it out to read. I found America author Washington Irving wrote the short story, The Legend of Sleep Hollow, published in the 1820s. The tale revealed how an artilleryman, during the American Revolution, gets killed when decapitated by a cannonball. His remains were buried without a head, as it was never found resulting in the birth of vengeful spirit to rise every Halloween night to seek it out. The ghost became the headless horseman and for the longest time I believed it was only a work of fiction, until I researched into Irish folklore. Apparently, the concept of this ghost may have originated from the Irish legend of a headless fairy called the Dullahan. This creature in described by law as either a headless man or woman, carrying a whip made from a human corpse's spine, while riding on a horse-drawn wagon at night through the countryside. In different version of the myth, the Dullahan's head is said to be under his arm, held up high in the air or on the lap smiling with a sinister grin as the eyes constantly move side to side searching the land. As legends warns, an encounter with this fairy meant death would soon follow. If the Dullahan ever stopped riding, someone within the area would die. A person could instant be killed if the creature pointed at them and spoke their name. Even some stories mention, when one's time among the living was up, the headless horseman came to that person. In every account, this rider can not be evaded as whatever locked barrier he approaches will open up allowing him through. Some legends do mention a defense or a means of escape, if every faced with the headless horseman which is to lay down a gold coin in his path which either he would be frightened of or caused to collect it. The headless horseman is truly a frightening image for anyone to conceive through legend or watch in entertainment, yet what would be the outcome to confront it in really life? Sightings of this creature have been reported in the past, as today some posts online mention accounts of encountering a headless entity before the death of a loved one. Hopefully this Halloween the only headless people you encounter are those wanting candy. Creepy Cemetery Experience Tonight my mother and I went to visit my brother after he got off work. Well we visited him for about an hour. He was watching that TV show called The Haunting. So my mom and I decided to leave. I was wanting an ice cream cone. So my mom and I went to Sonic and I got an ice cream cone and my mom got a large coke. My mom and I decided to go visit the creepy cemetery while I ate my ice cream cone. This was about 8.30 at night and pitch dark. So we went up to the cemetery where my grandfather was buried. While sitting at the cemetery I ate my ice cream while my mom got out of my car to smoke. We both had this bad feeling like we shouldn't be there, will my mom just all of a sudden jumped in my car and said let's get the fuck out of here because I just heard someone trip and fall by the headstones on your side of the car. We are not the only ones here. Go go go. So I turned my car around while locking my doors and rolling up window. I even shined my headlights in the direction of the sound of the person tripping and falling, but didn't see anyone. We both had a bad feeling like someone was there that had bad intentions. My mom was so scared she was hyperventilating. I hauled ass out of there. When my mom finally calmed down she said no more going to cemeteries after dark. Way too scary and dangerous, we used to love going to the cemetery after dark to get creeped out. Will we got the ultimate creep out and will never be going to cemeteries again after dark. Who knows who or what was there and what their intentions were. For all we knew we could have been raped and murdered. I used to go cemeteries after dark by myself. No anymore. Too scary and dangerous. P.S. My dad hates when we go to cemeteries after dark. He said it's too dangerous. We he was at my cousin's house visiting while my mom and I went to the cemetery. My mom called my dad about our experience and he was pissed. He said never to visit cemeteries after dark. My mom also called my brother and told him about it and he was freaked out too. By Susan Allison. My skinwalker encounter. Navajo may disagree with historians on the Onis' origins and departure. According to Navajo legend, they simply disappeared from existence, leaving behind plates, dishes, and food, and went into another dimension or some equivalent. But, whatever the history, Navajo do not like to wander in Anazazi ruins. I never asked why, but figured it had something to do with disrespect, preserving history, etc. As such, none of the others cared a bit about these canyon ruins. They were more interested in shooting pistols. 
I could see old beds, ladders, and even cave drawings on the cliffs with my naked eye. And I got this strange fixation on going over there. I am not Navajo, and felt that the rules didn't apply to me. I set off down the cliffs without rope and decided I would climb down, cross the canyon floor, and then climb back up. This was a bad idea for a million reasons, but it was like some obsession. I can't explain the feeling. It was like magnetism. I wanted to be in those ruins and it wasn't just some tourist-like curiosity. It felt like I was meant to go there. I kept slipping and getting stuck on the rocks, and I was so frustrated I almost started crying. Finally, I was deterred by the unmistakable sound of a growl coming from the canyon floor below me. There were trees down there so I couldn't see what was making the growl, but Mountain Lion immediately rose to mind and I got my ass back up the cliffside. I said nothing to the others, and we shot the guns for a while. The only other strange occurrence was while Sarah was aiming, things got eerily quiet. We all heard a sound from behind us, maybe 20 feet away. It was almost a growl, then a hoarse laugh. Almost like a lion, and then a hyena. We had a clear view of the entire area and there was nothing there, certainly not on the cliff tops where we heard it anyway. The creepy part was that while David, Sarah and I all heard it from a close distance, Luke heard the exact same noise right by his ear. We ended up camping out there to see if anything would happen, and this is when I got completely terrified. Before, I was only scared of wild animals. We had guns though, and were sleeping with no bags or tents, just some blankets under the stars and a little fire, so I felt safe when we all laid down. I fell asleep pretty quickly, but woke up a few hours later to see everyone else laying with their eyes open wide, listening. The canyon was completely full of noises. The only way to describe it is people banging rocks together. There would be one set maybe 300 yards away, then another clacking 200 yards away, and then 50 yards away. The canyon echoes, so it was hard to tell exactly how many rock smacking rock noises there were, but they sounded like Morse code. We listened to this for maybe 10 minutes. No other animal noises, no nothing. Finally David, who is kind of a hard ass and the least superstitious of his family shouted, Shut you 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 pee, and everything immediately stopped. My heart was in my throat. We just sat there and stared at each other, wide-eyed. It was dead quiet, and then we heard another super weird noise from the Anazazi ruins. I don't know how to explain this one either, but it sounded kind of like a zebra noise. Like these squeaky trills. It got louder, and then the rock sticks whatever started up again. But this was worse, because now other animal noises came. We heard what sounded like wolves or coyotes barking, monkeys screeching, in my opinion, those were the most terrifying, owls hooting, and through it all that terrible zebra noises. We said nope, and got our happy little asses out of there immediately. It took us maybe 10 minutes to douse the fire, pack our blankets, and speed away, and the noises were continuing that entire time. That night I was obviously pretty shaken up. Before I could fall asleep again, my Navajo mother came and sat by me, and said that she could tell I had a rough day, we hadn't mentioned the creepy shit, to avoid a lecture about fucking with the spirits. She asked me about it, and I ended up spilling my guts about not seeing the canyon ruins. It was something personal, it felt like. I wanted to go there, why couldn't I go there? It would have been beautiful. After I told her all about it, I could see that she had a really concerned look on her face. What is it? I asked, totally confused, and she explained something I had no idea about. The spirits in the ruins like to lure people up. When they get up on the ground, the spirits push them off. That's why we don't go there. I remained creeped out for the remainder of the visit. The town has a public accessible kaiva, kind of a tourist trap for a little pot and place, but since I didn't see the ruins up close, I went down into the kaiva. And I went alone, as of course my superstitious family refused to enter other natives' dwellings. I figured that nothing could push me off a cliff if I was in a kaiva. I was right, but something even worse happened. Fast forward to a few weeks later. I worked at a shitty call center in Salt Lake City, third shift. It was my first night alone and I was feeling jumpy ever since the kaiva. My brothers already warned me that I had a skinwalker following me, but I, of course, didn't believe it. I don't smoke, but I followed my co-workers out for smoke breaks because I like to chat. Tonight, I lurked in the doorway because I had this horrible cloud of dread hanging over me. I was peeping out the glass door and being a total weirdo. It hit me then how paranoid I had been. That's what skinwalkers do, they mess with your mind. 
While I was pacing in front of the glass doors, I decided that this whole thing was fucking stupid and I was going to go outside and stand there for the rest of my 10 minute break. Most of the smokers were already filing back in, but I walked out and put my hands in my pockets. Looked at the sky, looked in the building, mentally patting myself on the back for not being a pussy. Then I saw something that I will never ever be able to give a rational or even halfway accountable explanation for. We have like, six parking lots. In one of the lots far away from me, maybe 100 feet, I could see something walking. It was a dog, obviously, but it was almost limping and walked like it was tired or hurt. Animal lover me forgot all about skinwalkers and I started walking toward it, making the TCH 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 mute doggy noises. And then I stopped abruptly. The dog had the body form of a greyhound, and it was grey, but there was something very wrong with it. It had bloody legs and limped, but it walked more like a person would on feet and hands, its butt was moving to and fro if that makes any sense. When it hurt me, it just stopped without turning, something I've never known any dog to do. And finally, it looked over its shoulder at me and this is the freaky part. This dog was looking at me the way a person does. It had huge eyes, way too big for a greyhound, and its teeth were bared like it was considering biting me. Then it growled, but it was like a whistle growl. Noises no regular animal makes. It almost sounded like it wanted to talk to me or was taunting me. Somehow in the middle of all this I realized it didn't have a tail, and I heard from all Navajo stories that skinwalkers, when they appear as animals, don't have tails. Forgetting all logic and rationality, I turned and jetted. I didn't look back until I was back inside the building and had pulled the doors shut behind me, and by then when I looked of course the fucking thing was gone. When I described this to my brothers they were absolutely sure it was a skinwalker, and they went through the trouble of blessing me, my apartment, them, and their apartments. I never saw the creepy bloody dog again, and I have never since even slightly wanted to visit cliff ruins. As I lie here upon my bed, thinking all of what's been said, control is strong, it comes from thee, am I blind, I couldn't see, possession was the word from you, there's nothing that I wouldn't do, afraid to run, afraid to hide, knowing that I hurt inside, a trophy that is made to show, letting everybody know, Crowd is thee, when I'm on show, but little do they really know, you show me strength within your arms, you lie me down, and try to calm, you talk of love within my heart, but now it's only ripped apart, I hurt real bad, deep within, the price I paid, for your sins, you took my life, and own it now, I can't say when, or even how, you took my mind I had no say, all I know, I'll have to stay, perhaps one day, you will see, the only way, it'll have to be, and that my love, is set me free. Heart Lake Monster Heart Lake Monster is a short scary story about a young man who hires a boat and goes for an evening cruise on the lake where his father disappeared. My mother had always warned me to keep away from Heart Lake. Years ago, my father disappeared under mysterious circumstances while on a fishing trip at the lake. The police dragged the deep, dark waters, but no trace of him was ever found. They told us he was presumed dead and that his body would soon surface, but it never did. I remember attending the funeral as a young boy. I recall overhearing the adults whispering to each other when they thought I was out of earshot. For years afterwards, there were rumors around the town about something supernatural that lurked in the darkest recesses of Heart Lake. As I grew older, I dismissed all the talk as simple superstition, but for some reason, I became obsessed with the lake. I had an overpowering desire to visit the very place which I had always been warned to avoid. One summer evening, I set out with my fishing rod and cycled in the direction of Heart Lake. After traveling down narrow country roads and crossing fields, I eventually arrived at Heart Lake and was greeted with a sight that made me gasp with delight. Never in my life have I seen a body of water so clear and so still. Not even the tiniest of ripples disturbed its placid surface. I was able to hire a boat and began rowing across the lake towards one of the many small islands. Halfway to the island the boat came to a sudden and abrupt stop. Puzzled, I kept rowing, but the boat refused to move. I peered into the water on both sides but could see nothing that would stop the boat and hold it so fast. Suddenly, the boat began to move sideways, gliding silently along as if it was being towed by something underwater. 
Before I knew it, I heard a cracking sound and was horrified to see the wooden sides of the boat bending inward as if they were being crushed. Water began to gush in and I became frantic, searching for something to use to bail it out. Then I saw it. Something reared up above the surface of the water. At first it looked like some floating, formless, lifeless blob. Then, the thing swelled upwards until two bulging eyes came into view just above the water level. The wooden boat popped and snapped under me and just before it finally collapsed, I managed to dive sideways into the icy water of Heart Lake. Terror overcame me and I began swimming towards the shore as if my life depended on it. I had barely scrambled up on the bank when I heard the thing slithering out of the water behind me. Moving with amazing speed the monster slid along the ground in pursuit. Something cold and slimy flowed over my foot and wrapped itself around my left leg. Then I lost my balance and felt myself being dragged, slowly and relentlessly toward the water. I managed to twist my body around, only to see those horrid bulbous eyes glaring at me. The colossal, shapeless blob seemed to flow along the ground, dragging me with it. My hands frantically searched for something to hang on to. Luckily I managed to throw my arms around a small tree, locking my fingers together and hanging on for dear life. I looked down and saw the leg of my jeans disappearing in a bubbling mess. Screaming with terror, I felt an agonizing pain as the creature began to digest my bare leg. Try as I might, I couldn't jerk my leg free from its deathly embrace. Still clutching the tree with one hand, I managed to pull a small knife out of my pocket. Desperately, I began stabbing the slimy blob but every time I plunged the knife into the beast, it sank out of sight in that shapeless mass of blubber, which closed oozingly over it. Against such a formidable foe my weapon seemed ridiculously puny. The pain in my leg became unbearable and I found myself groaning and screaming in agony. The thing was pulling with more and more force and suddenly, I heard a cracking sound. The small tree I was hanging onto snapped in half and I was left holding the top of it as the creature dragged me towards the water. Just when I thought I was done for, I saw something which had previously escaped my notice. In the middle of the huge bulbous mass of jelly, I could make out a small, throbbing, discolored globule about the size of a football. It throbbed and squirmed within the huge shapeless monster as if it was the creature's heart. Whatever it was, it looked like a vital organ and I decided that would have to be my target. With the knife in my right hand and the small tree in my left, I had less than a minute to save myself. With three or four quick strokes, I sharpened the tree into a rough spike. Taking careful aim, I drew my arm back as far as I dared, and plunged the makeshift spear straight through that slimy mass and into its throbbing heart. A terrific shudder ran all through that enormous body. Slowly its grip on me relaxed. I expected to see the blob sink beneath the water's surface, but instead it started to swell up like a balloon. I thought that it was going to swallow me whole as the blubber engulfed me. I shut my eyes and prayed. Suddenly, it exploded, showering me in a slimy, glistening substance. All that was left of the creature was a dripping mass of goo. Feeling myself free from that terrible embrace, I leaped to my feet and stumbled madly up a tangled trail that led away from the lake. As I limped homewards, nursing my injured leg, I felt relief but also a strange sense of accomplishment. I realized that in one night, I had solved the mystery of my father's disappearance and also managed to kill his murderer, the Heart Lake Monster. Time and eternity it is helpful to man's cosmic orientation to attain all possible comprehension of deity's relation to the cosmos. While absolute deity is eternal in nature, the gods are related to time as an experience in eternity. In the evolutionary universe's eternity is temporal everlastingness. The everlasting now. The personality of the mortal creature may eternalize by self-identification with the indwelling spirit through the technique of choosing to do the will of the father. Such a consecration of will is tantamount to the realization of eternity reality of purpose. This means that the purpose of the creature has become fixed with regard to the succession of moments. Stated otherwise, that the succession of moments will witness no change in creature purpose. A million or a billion moments makes no difference. Number has ceased to have meaning with regard to the creature's purpose. 
Thus does creature choice plus God's choice eventuate in the eternal realities of the never-ending union of the Spirit of God and the nature of man in the everlasting service of the children of God and of their Paradise Father. There is a direct relationship between maturity and the unit of time consciousness in any given intellect. The time unit may be a day, a year, or a longer period, but inevitably it is the criterion by which the conscious self evaluates the circumstances of life and by which the conceiving intellect measures and evaluates the facts of temporal existence. Experience, wisdom, and judgment are the concomitants of the lengthening of the time unit in mortal experience. As the human mind reckons backward into the past, it is evaluating past experience for the purpose of bringing it to bear on a present situation. As mind reaches out into the future, it is attempting to evaluate the future significance of possible action. And having thus reckoned with both experience and wisdom, the human will exercise his judgment decision in the present, and the plan of action thus born of the past and the future becomes existent. In the maturity of the developing self, the past and future are brought together to illuminate the true meaning of the present. As the self matures, it reaches further and further back into the past for experience, while its wisdom forecasts seek to penetrate deeper and deeper into the unknown future. And as the conceiving self extends this reach ever further into both past and future, so does judgment become less and less dependent on the momentary present. In this way does decision action begin to escape from the fetters of the moving present, while it begins to take on the aspects of past future significance. Patience is exercised by those mortals whose time units are short. True maturity transcends patience by a forbearance born of real understanding. To become mature is to live more intensely in the present, at the same time escaping from the limitations of the present. The plans of maturity, founded on past experience, are coming into being in the present in such manner as to enhance the values of the future. The time unit of immaturity concentrates meaning value into the present moment in such a way as to divorce the present of its true relationship to the not present, the past future. The time unit of maturity is proportioned so to reveal the coordinate relationship of past present future that the self begins to gain insight into the wholeness of events begins to view the landscape of time from the panoramic perspective of broadened horizons, begins perhaps to suspect the non-beginning, non-ending eternal continuum, the fragments of which are called time. On the levels of the infinite and the absolute the moment of the present contains all of the past as well as all of the future. I am signifies also I was and I will be. And this represents our best concept of eternity and the eternal. On the absolute and eternal level, Potential reality is just as meaningful as actual reality. Only on the finite level and to time-bound creatures does there appear to be such a vast difference. To God, as absolute, an ascending mortal who has made the eternal decision is already a paradise finalita. But the universal father, through the indwelling thought adjuster, is not thus limited in awareness but can also know of, and participate in, every temporal struggle with the problems of the creature ascent from animal-like to godlike levels of existence. Smoky night eyes, flowing through smoky night skies, playing shadow with mystical trees that speaks only in blowing leaves, tears drip past a silver distant cover, closing curtains to memories over fragile twinkling stars. Red breeze walk on top of every scream, silencing wanting souls, breath in all the flames that rolls in a soft bed of lust only giving ghost to know it's still close, so close even these rivers of blood in this tainted flesh flows beyond each cut. Every suspended moment and quiet sits with each convention we never heard, let go, go away, shadows crawling beneath rose petals, haunted in cold, should we forget these closing night kiss in our awaking emptiness. Still waiting for tears to comfort the frozen cheek and icy bites find their way up against everything that matters and night will sleep in these creeps with all my death as dawn will cradle only till another death in my soul, ghosts, my haunted shadows beneath this beating jade, memories that should fade but never fall too far from creatures lullaby, my beautiful smoky night's eyes. The girl next door. The Girl Next Door is a scary and odd ghost story about a brother and sister who meet a rich young girl that lives in a mansion near their house. Elispa looked at the large, crumbling mansion that lay across the fields from her little house. It had been empty for as long as she could remember. Every day, she gazed at it from her bedroom window and imagined what it would be like to live there. Elispa and her brother Chris lived with their parents in a small, dilapidated house. Her family was poor and they couldn't afford to make the necessary repairs. 
Eliska was always too embarrassed to invite any of her friends over after school. One night, Eliska had a very strange dream about the old mansion. She dreamed that a beautiful young girl lived in the mansion and she invited Eliska to come inside. In the dream, the mansion was filled with ornate furnishings and the walls were lined with expensive paintings. She dreamed that the girl showed her a room that was filled with beautiful jewelry. The next morning, when she awoke, Eliska looked out the window and noticed something different about the mansion. It looked as if the walls had been freshly painted and there were curtains in the windows. It seemed like someone had moved in after all. At breakfast that morning, she told Chris about her strange dream. That's funny, Chris replied. I had almost the exact same dream. That's weird, Eliska said, puzzled. Chris nodded in agreement. That evening, when Eliska and Chris were playing in the field beside their house, they met a strange young girl. She was very a beautiful girl with long dark hair and dark eyes. She was wearing an exquisite dress that shimmered in the fading light. Hello, she said. Hi, Chris replied. Who are you? My name is Angela, the girl said. I'm your new neighbor. My parents and I just moved into the mansion over there. When she heard this, Eliska's mouth dropped open in astonishment. She was lost for words. I'm Chris and this is my sister Eliska, Chris said. Pleased to meet you, Angela said as she shook their hands. Since I'm new in town, I don't really know anyone. Would you two be my friends? Of course, Eliska said eagerly. Sure, said Chris. I'm so glad, Angela said. Would you like to come and see our mansion? We would be delighted, Eliska said. Together, they walked through the tall grass until they came to the mansion. Angela opened the front door and they followed her inside. The house was beautiful. It was filled with ornate furniture and expensive looking paintings adorned the walls. When they went into the living room, they saw an elaborate chandelier hanging from the ceiling, just like in their dream. Hello mother, hello father, Angela said. Her parents were sitting on the sofa, reading newspapers. They didn't look up as the youngsters filed past. Come with me, Eliska, said Angela. I want to show you my playroom. I think you'll like it. She opened a door and ushered Eliska inside. Eliska couldn't believe her eyes. It was exactly like the room she had seen in her dreams. The walls were lined with glass cases, containing beautiful, intricate jewelry that sparkled in the light. Eliska couldn't take her eyes off it. She was mesmerized. Try on anything you like, Angela said. I'll let you keep whichever one you like the most. Eliska gasped as Angela left the room, shutting the door behind her. The girl moved from case to case, examining all the gorgeous necklaces, earrings and brooches. She didn't know how much time had passed, but the spell was broken by a loud scream. It came from outside and it sounded like her brother's voice. All of a sudden, she looked around and saw that the room was changing. There were cobwebs and dark stains on the ceiling. The faded wallpaper was peeling off the walls. The lush carpet was gone and the floorboards were covered in damp mold. The wooden door was rotten and the hinges were rusty. Eliska grabbed the handle and pulled with all her might. She pulled so hard that the door came off its hinges and fell to the ground with a crash. When she went into the living room, she was shocked to see everything covered in dust. The plaster was failing off the walls. Sitting on the couch, where Angela's parents had been just moments before, were two mummified corpses. Their flesh was rotting off, exposing the bone underneath and their faces were twisted in a silent, eternal scream. Rats scurried furtively back and forth across the bare floor which was strewn with trash. In the middle of the room, where there had once been a coffee table, there was a large, dusty coffin and its lid was hanging open. Chris, where are you? She cried as she frantically looked around the room. Just then, her brother came staggering down the stairs. He was clutching his neck and blood was pouring down the front of his shirt. He opened his mouth to speak, but all that came out was a gurgling sound. His throat had been slashed open. Angela appeared on the stairs behind him. She looked much taller and her face was deathly pale. Her cheeks were sunken and her skin was lined and wrinkled. Eliska's heart sank and she felt as if she was going to faint. Angela's mouth opened wide, revealing sharp pointed teeth, tipped with blood. She lunged at Chris, biting into his throat and ripping out a chunk of flesh. Eliska let out a terrified shriek and ran to the front door. She was dizzy with fear, 
but she managed to pull it open and when she got outside, she ran as fast as she could. Tears were streaming down her cheeks and she couldn't stop screaming. She ran and ran across the field, wading through the tall grass, her heart beating fast and her hair standing on end. Eventually, she reached the safety of her own house. She rushed inside and slammed the door behind her. Then, in confusion, she looked around. She saw the dust, the cobwebs, the rats, the open coffin and the dead body of her brother lying in a pool of blood on the floor. To her utter horror, she was back inside Angela's house and there stood Angela, smiling from ear to ear, with blood dripping down her chin. Before Elispa had a chance to react, Angela grabbed her by the shoulders and pulled her close. The last thing Elispa felt before everything went black was a pair of fangs sinking into her neck. Shattered. My heart in pain my feet and my mind shattered. My voice weak my body cold my memories fading and my face blue. By Susan Allison. De prestigiis demonum, source, Wikipedia. De prestigiis demonum translated as On the Tricks of Demons is a book that was a bestseller by demonologist Johann Weyer, also known as Weirus, first published in Basel in 1563. Synopsis The book also contains a famous appendix also circulated independently as the Pseudomonarchia Demonum, a listing of the names and titles of infernal spirits, and the powers alleged to be wielded by each of them. Wire relates that his source for this intelligence was a book called Liber Officierum Spiritum, Su Liber Dictus Empto Solomonis, De Principibus et Regibus Demonirum, the book of the offices of spirits, or the book called Empto, by Solomon, about the princes and kings of demons. Wire's reason for presenting this material was not to instruct his readers in diabolism, but rather to expose to all men the pretensions of those who claimed to be able to work magic, men who are not embarrassed to boast that they are mages. And their ardness, deceptions, vanity, folly, fakery, madness, absence of mind, and obvious lies, to put their hallucinations into the bright light of day. Wire's source alleged there were estimated to be 7,451,926 devils, divided into 1,111 legions and obeying 72 infernal princes. Wire's source claimed that hell arranged itself hierarchically in an infernal court which is divided into princes, ministries and ambassadors. The book is remembered for two things. While Wire held to a demonology that was entirely orthodox in terms of its endorsement of the reality of Satan and evil demonic spirits, while maintaining at all times that their ability to act was circumscribed by the omnipotence of God, he disagreed with certain of his contemporaries about the justification of witch hunting. Wire believed that most, probably all, cases of alleged witchcraft resulted from delusions of the alleged witch, rather than actual, voluntary cooperation with spiritual evil. In brief, Wire claimed that cases of alleged witchcraft were psychological rather than supernatural in origin. Legacy de Prestigiis has been translated into English, French, and German. It was one of the principal sources of Reginald Scott's skeptical account of witchcraft, the discovery of witchcraft. Peg Entwistle. Her death set a new standard for suicide in Hollywood. Peg had been born in London, England in 1908. She grew up in an acting family. Although little is known about her early life, save for the fact that her mother died when Peg was quite young, she left Peg's father to raise a daughter and her two brothers, Robert and Milton, alone. A short time later, Peg's father packed up and moved the family to New York where he started working in local theater. Unfortunately, tragedy struck again and Peg's father was run over by a truck on Park Avenue, ending his life. Robert and Milton were then sent to Los Angeles to live with Harold Entwistle, their uncle, and Peg turned to the stage for solace. She made her acting debut in Hamlet when she was just 17 years old. To everyone's surprise, she quickly became a bona fide star, loved by audiences, critics and directors alike. There was no question about it. Peg was a knockout and possessed a gentle quality which won the hearts of just about everyone she ever worked with. She quickly became a Broadway star and a member of the New York Theatre Guild. While working on Broadway, Peg met a fellow actor named Robert Keith. He was also a popular star and despite as being 10 years Peg senior, the two soon fell in love and got married. But the marriage soured quickly. During a visit to her mother-in-law's house, Peg noticed a photograph of a young boy on the mantel. She asked who he was and was informed that he was Robert's son from his first marriage, something that he had kept hidden from her. Incidentally, that surprise stepson was future actor Brian Keith, star of the television show Family Affair. Just weeks later, during a dinner party at their home, a police officer came to the door and demanded nearly $1,000 in back child support that Robert owed. Peg got the money together, but when she asked Robert about it, 
he became violent. The bad debts, lies and fights ended the marriage and they were soon divorced. Peg went back to the Broadway stage, but this part of her life was also coming to an end. The Great Depression had arrived and the majority of the public could no longer afford the expensive theater tickets. Thanks to this, Peg's last seven New York plays bombed, but all wasn't lost. While Broadway may have been suffering, Hollywood was still in its boom era. During Peg's initial fame in New York, Hollywood was making the transition from silent films to talkies. Unfortunately, many of the silent film stars were just not cut out for talking roles and Hollywood producers looked to the actors of the New York stage to fill the acting rosters. Many other stage actors were making it big in Hollywood, so Peg packed up and took the train to California, sure that greater fame and fortune waited for her on the West Coast. When she arrived, Peg moved into a Beechwood Canyon bungalow with her brothers and Uncle Harold. The house was located in the Hollywoodland subdivision just under the towering sign where Peg would later take her life. Not long after she arrived in Hollywood, found work in small theater. The first production she did was a play called Mad Hopes, starring Billy Burke, who would go on to play Glenda the Good Witch in The Wizard of Oz. Also in the show was another Hollywood newcomer named Humphrey Bogart. The play opened to decent reviews, but only lasted a week and a half. When the curtain fell on Mad Hopes, Peg saw it as another personal failure. She began to wonder if her New York jinx had followed her to Tinseltown. However, she would go on to appear with Billy Burke in a few more small productions although Bogart returned to New York. His days of fame and fortune were still to come. Thanks to her good looks and her popularity on Broadway, Peg landed a short-term contract with RKO Studios and within weeks of her arrival, landed a small part in the film 13 Women. She knew that even though it was a small part, it would lead to other offers. It was only her first movie role. She realized, little did she know that it would turn out to be her last. During filming, Peg discovered the part was actually a supporting role, but a good one. Her hopes began to rise. The movie was released, only to be savaged by the critics. RKO quickly shelved it. It was released quietly a short time later but substantial cuts had been made to the 73-minute running time. Peg's part, despite her good showing, had been reduced to little more than a cameo appearance. Once more. She was bitterly disappointed, but vowed to not let it get to her. She began answering ads for small parts and going to auditions and casting calls. However, Peg soon found that she was just another pretty face in a town filled with beautiful women. All of them had come to Hollywood for the same reason, to make it into show business. And things went from bad to worse. Her option with RKO ran out and they declined to renew it. She was cut loose and on her own, now unable to even find work in small theater. Soon. Promises of future work quickly vanished. As her career fell apart, her new friends made themselves scarce. No one can afford to be seen with a nobody in Hollywood. Peg Entwistle, the gorgeous young woman who had shot to fame on Broadway, had now fallen to the bottom of the Hollywood barrel. She became even more depressed when she was unable to even scrape together train fare to go back to New York. She would never act again. So, on that terrible night in September 1932, Peg announced to her uncle Harold that she was going to take a walk. She was last seen alive heading down Beechwood Canyon toward Mount Lee. Apparently, Peg scratched her way up the slope to the Hollywood sign where she took off her coat and folded it neatly. She placed it, along with her purse, at the base of the maintenance ladder which led up the letter H. She climbed to the top and then plunged to her death. The next day, a woman hiker in Griffith Park discovered the purse and coat near the ladder. She opened the purse and discovered a suicide note inside. It read simply I am afraid I am a coward. I am sorry for everything. If I had done this a long time ago it would have saved a lot of pain. P. The hiker replaced the note and then, in the early morning hours, placed the purse and coat on the doorstep of the Hollywood police station. Two days later, authorities discovered the body of Peg Entwistle in the brush at the bottom of Mount Lee. Unsure of her identity, the police ran a description of the woman, along with the contents of the suicide note, in the newspaper. They were quickly contacted by Uncle Harold, who had been frantically searching for his niece since she had left for her walk several evenings before. He feared the worst when he saw the initials attached to the end of the note. Not long after, he identified the body as that of Peg Entwistle. And here's where the ultimate irony comes in. Two days later, Uncle Harold was sifting through the afternoon mail and he discovered a letter that had been mailed to Peg the day before she jumped to her death. The letter was from the Beverly Hills Playhouse and it had been written to offer Peg the lead role in their next production. But wait, it gets even better the part was that of a beautiful young woman who commits suicide in the final act of the play. 
Pretty spooky, isn't it? But death was not the last act for Peg Entwistle. In the years following her suicide, hikers and park rangers in Griffith Park have reported some pretty strange happening in the vicinity of the Hollywood sign. Many have reported sightings of a woman dressed in 1930s-era clothing who abruptly vanishes when approached. She has been described as a very attractive, blonde woman, who seems very sad. Could this be Peg's ghost, still making her presence known? Could she also be linked to the pungent smell of gardenia perfume which has been known to overwhelm sightseers in the park? Perhaps it is, as the gardenia scent was known to be Peg's trademark perfume. In 1990, a North Hollywood man and his girlfriend were walking on a Beechwood Canyon trail near the Hollywood sign with their dog when the animal suddenly began to act very strange. Instead of running around on the trail and through the brushes he normally did, he began to whine and hang back near the couple. They had never seen him act that way before and could find no cause until they spotted a lady walking nearby. One thing they noticed about her was that she was wearing clothing from the 1930s. However, thinking that you could see anything in Hollywood, they didn't pay much attention. The lady however, seemed to be walking in a daze. Thinking that perhaps she was drunk or on drugs, they started to steer clear of her when she suddenly just faded away before their eyes. At that time, they had no idea who Peg Entwistle was nor that she had committed suicide nearby, or even that her ghost reportedly haunted the area. Imagine their surprise when they found out. Another eyewitness to this haunting was a Griffith Park ranger named John Arbogast. In an interview, he revealed his own encounters with the ghost of Peg Entwistle. He stated that she normally made her presence known very late at night, especially when it was foggy, and always in the vicinity of the Hollywood sign. He also claimed to have encountered the scent of gardenias in the area as well. I have smelled it several times, he said, and always when any flowers around have been closed because of cold weather. I don't think I have ever smelled it in the summer time. Arbogast's duties as a ranger often involved the Hollywood sign itself. He explained that in recent years, alarm systems have been installed near the sign to keep people away from it. There is always a danger of vandals, and of course, suicides who want to go out the same way that Peg did. The alarm systems incorporate the use of motion detectors and lights to keep intruders away. Arbogast recalled a number of times when the alarm system stated that someone was close to the sign. Even though a check by the ranger revealed no one was there, there have been times when I have been at the sign, he said, and the motion detectors say that someone is standing five feet away from me, only there's nobody there. So, what could have made Peg Entwistle choose to end her life in such a dramatic and violent way? No one knows but we have to wonder. The Hollywood slogan states that the sign exists as a symbol of hope, so that those who answer the siren call of Hollywood will know that anything in the city is possible. But did Peg glimpse that sign one evening, after spending the day going from one pointless casting call to another, and see it not as a symbol of hope, but one of despair? Did she feel that sign mocking her, laughing that so many others had made it in the movies? So why couldn't she? Did the glowing lights of the sign remind her of why she had come to Hollywood? chasing the bright lights she would never catch up to? Or perhaps she just wanted to go out in a way that people would remember? If this was the case, she was right. Who may have ever heard of Peg Entwistle if not for the fact that she took that fatal plunge from the very symbol of Hollywood itself? It is certain that Peg gained much more fame in death than she ever gained in life. To young actors and would-be stars, Peg has become a sort of a patron saint to failed actors in Hollywood. Perhaps this isn't a good thing though. Everyone, Karen here. Rob has asked me to tell you about the experiences I had as a child living in a haunted house. I, Anne, my siblings, grew up in a two-story, sandstone that was built in the 1830s. It is called the Blue Bell Inn and it is in Sorrel in Tasmania. When I was 16, I saw the full body of a woman ghost at the top of the stairs, unsure of what I had actually seen. I asked my mom and dad about it and they told me the house was haunted. Dad knew of four spirits that were in the house. Once dad told me about the ghosts, it actually answered a few questions for me about the unusual things that had been happening around the house, like things being moved from one place to another, strange noises you would not expect to hear inside a house, and the feeling on being really cold in one particular room. One night we heard a chain rattling and dad, thinking the goat was off the tether, went downstairs to check and realized, after the fourth trip down the stairs, that it was actually the old man with his wheelbarrow going up and down the road. Here is a picture that was taken in 1978 of the stairway in the house. This actual photo was sent to the New South Wales State University and was authenticated as being real. 